I'm Mark Boris, and this is Straight Talk. John Kavanagh, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Yeah, nice to be here in person. Yeah, totally. Your last one was uh, by video. Uh, you're in Australia. We'll talk about why you're in Australia a little bit later. Um, in, and you're in Australia for business. I mean, you're a small, you're a, a startup business owner along with Nick and all your shareholders and um, probably a little bit beyond a startup now. You're certainly across the globe. We'll talk about that business a little bit later, and that's why you're here in Australia doing your rounds. Um, not sure boxing rounds but, or fighting rounds, but uh, – Business similar, rounds. similar. So it is similar, very similar. <laughs> Let's talk about you a little bit here because you're the sort of the key to the lock of the organisation that you and Nick and others have built and building and a lot of it comes out of your experiences, your head um, and the demand for your product to some extent uh, reflects what goes on in society today. And that we're talking about violence, protecting yourself from violence. Another way of putting it is getting an edge, improving your life, your health, whatever it may be, or confronting your demons even. Your business is called Alta, which sort of indicates to me it's um, – Alta mean, means up higher to me or something like that. And uh, your program is called Alta Warrior. Is there some undercurrent in your life and in your culture, and probably here too in Australia, undercurrent of violence that we have to respond to i'll give a connor quote here he, he talks about in dublin and i think it's probably the same in a lot of cities that growing up in school two guys stood out one who was the fastest and the other who was the best fire that was in school that's what everybody talked about and uh, that's probably the same even going back a lot of societies like you know when if there was going to be a tribal war you want to know who could get a message to the next town so you have to find the fastest guy and then if you're going to have one of your tribe represent you against one of their tribe to hopefully avoid massive bloodshed, was, let's get the best fighters to go forward. Um, in terms of sport in Ireland, you know, our best sport at the games has always, been, has always been boxing. That's where we get most of our medals. So there is a bit of that in our culture, you know, and there's the stereotype of the Irish guy that likes a few pints at the weekend and a few, maybe a few punches at the end of it. But all of that, um, I, I think what MMA does and combat sports in general is give a very healthy outlet for that maybe natural urge to want to dominate, to want to fight, to be involved in violence in some way or another. And it's, it's you know, certainly in, in Ireland and, and I'm sure plenty of places around America, you know, you talk about the Bronx and all the great boxers that came from those type of areas. Their lives were literally saved by having that aggression, that anger being channeled through a healthy sport, getting the outlet done in a safe environment, the boxing ring or the MMA cage, and then being able to go on and do, be, be a valuable member of society. Love Hate, is a, it was a great series. It's a kind of funny story that when that was getting very popular, that's actually when Conor was getting ready to make his debut in, uh, in the UFC. And the morning where we were leaving Dublin to go to Sweden for that fight, Actually, through a few contacts, got one of the characters, Frano, one of Connor's sparring partners, great guy, Philip Mulpeter. We called him Frano throughout the training camp because he's a bit like him. If you, if you know Love Hate and you know Frano and you know Philip Mulpeter, you'd make the connection. And uh, of course, I had to be John Boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, to have him show up at the house of Blue Connor away, you know, to have, to have this guy that was a star at the time in Irish TV, gave us a nice little pep in our step as we made our way to Sweden for his thankfully successful uh, debut. You, you're talking about Connor, you know, and, and you're right, great fighters come out of the Bronx and same here in Sydney and Australia and various other parts of Australia. It gave him an outlet for guys who are talented who would probably get themselves into trouble otherwise, gave him an outlet to do it in a sort of legitimate way, so to speak, and, and become probably better people. But what about the people that all to worry a program brings in there, they might be a, you know, a mild man, a dentist down the road who's not really a violent person, but more probably around the other side of it is someone who's thinking about violence and maybe wants to challenge themselves. Yeah, well, that's me, you know. I, I wasn't the one in, in school that was known as the best fighter, far from it. If anything, I was the one maybe on the, on the wrong end of it, Receiving it. being somewhat bullied. Um, so I was the one drawn to mixed martial arts, not for a, for a healthy outlet, if you want to say, for violent tendencies. It was that I wanted to 
initially my my desire was so I could defend myself in a physical fight. Now, as an older man looking back, really what I was looking for was confidence because I did have one bad incident in my in my late teens and I learned how to de- defend myself. And since then, I've never been in a physical fight as a as a as a grown up, you know, never it just been tension and I think what having the ability to defend yourself physically does is that during those tense moments, you maybe carry yourself in a certain way that is maybe without using words, you let somebody know if this turns physical, I'm okay with that. But I'd rather it didn't. I'd rather we, you know, we use our, the front of our brain and not the back of our brain to try and get through this issue. Um, so yeah, I was drawn to mixed martial arts to learn it to defend myself. 18 or 19, and I was, I was walking through town with my girlfriend. And just to the side of me, there was a group of guys and they were giving poor lad on the ground a bit of a hammering. Uh, they, what had happened was I found out afterwards he was cycling past them and they dragged him off his bike and they gave him a bit of a pummel. And um, I, I stepped in, you know, tried to pull one or two guys, you know, leave him alone, whatever. And then bang, I got a whack. Now, I'd done some martial arts and, you know, like, like everybody maybe done a bit of martial arts throughout my life. And I was like, okay, uh, I'll be ready for this. And, you know, you're facing this guy. And then suddenly, boom, I got hit with a brick on the side of the face. I actually uh, broke my uh, orbital socket. And then they let me have it. So, you know, uh, good news was the other guy got up and he got away. So (laughs) I I achieved my goal uh, in in that sense. But unfortunately, uh, it didn't go like the movies. They, They didn't read the script. You're supposed to attack one at a time and give me a chance to use my techniques. <laughs> that all went out the window. It's just five guys at the same time. Um, it's funny now I look back and I was literally across the road from a, a cop station, a guard station. Now, with a bit more sense, I would have just sprinted across there, got the guards, it would have been solved like that. What did it do to you? It was a very dark time. I, I, I'll be honest, I, I didn't leave my house for about six months after that. I, 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 the girl I was with, we broke up. Um, I have really no value in myself. Um, it's, I think for, for young men, there's, there's, a, 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 for whatever reason we feel inside that we should be able to defend ourselves and defend our, our partner. I'm sure it goes back to caveman times and I had failed on that. And that took a long time for me to accept that and forgive myself and then to ultimate, ultimately learn from it. And it's one of those funny splits in the road that happens throughout our lives that at that time. If, that, if, if I could have given anything to rewind that moment and have that not happen, I'd have done anything to have, have that have not happened. And yet, in a weird, weird way, that split that happened at that time is why I'm sitting here. Talking and the to you. decisions you made post that. I wouldn't have bothered. Why would I have bothered going and tried to learn how to defend myself, which turned into mixed martial arts training, which turned into a career, which turned into me being... Here yeah, right now. Beautiful Sydney talking to you, you well, know? Well, I mean, I find, I find it fascinating that, um, and a lot of people, by the way, would not have made the decision after the six-month dark period to go and learn this and to dig their way out of it. Um, and uh, I asked you yesterday a question about, you know, an Australian boy who's a man who's a, you know, UFC world champion, Alice Volkanovsky. We talked about, you know, why does someone decide to dig their way out of a fucking situation when you're fucked you know like you know he was getting choked out the guillotine on him in his last fight or take but something he did mate dig, dug himself out other people would just tap out and say I'm, I'm done I'm, I'm i'm cooked what is it in your case in john kavanaugh's case that after a period of dark times you decided to dig yourself out and go and do something positive and learn mma and you know what, what was that god um i suppose what was the alternative You know, I tried a couple of months in my room. (laughs) That wasn't fun. Um, And I guess you just ask yourself a question like, am I going to do this forever? Or let's at least try something else. The worst had already happened. It wasn't going to get worse. I'd already been embarrassed. I'd already been battered. I'd already been put in hospital. What else are you going to give me? So, I, I, you know, when you hit bottom, right, you're only going to go up. So I figured, let's try and learn this sport. Let's try and learn this. At the time, I wasn't even concerned about sport. Let's try and learn this art. Let's try and learn this um, ability to defend myself. Because if I get beat up again, it's either going to be, it's only going to be as bad as it was, or maybe a little bit less bad. Maybe I can floor one guy the next yeah, time. Yeah. So I guess that was my mentality was that like, it's never going to be, it's never going to get worse than this. So try something. 
you were at college or at university or something at the time, were you, or were you just were you at school? So I was just at the finish of school. I took a year out. I was actually, um, I'd actually started a landscaping business when I left school. So I was 18 and for a year I started a landscaping business and very quick, funny story. So that day I got really badly beat up. The next morning I had to put up a fence and, you know, looking back now, I was, I had a fractured orbital socket and I was clearly concussed and I'd, I was, I'd hired a couple of my buddies to help me do it. I was only 18, you know, and, um, I'm holding in a post and my friend is on a ladder with a sledgehammer putting the post down and didn't he freaking miss the post and hit me on the head Are with a sledgehammer? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> So I'm already black and blue looking like the elephant man. Thanks very much. And my buddy hits me with a sledgehammer. <laughs> that, was, that was a rough job, you know, that, that, that job was tough. And, but you know what? I finished the day's work. I got the fence up and uh, I did that for about, I, I, like I said, I did it for a year. And then at the end of the year, my mother actually enrolled me in university to be an engineer. And I didn't really know much about it. My dad was a small um, uh, a property maintenance guy and we do some construction. And the only thing I knew about engineers was that when we were on the building site and I was the one making the tea and sweeping up, the engineer was a guy that came in in a suit, pointed out a few things and then left. And I said, I want to be that guy. <laughs> but your mama. Huh? So my mother, uh, you know, just through conversations, she'd filled in all the forms and literally told me one day, college starts in September and you're going to be an engineer. I mean, I tell you, you just reminded my, me and my late mother. Um, and we talked about my late mother yesterday, but, um, I was a kid growing up in school and uh, all I wanted to become was a footballer, a rugby league player, um, which is all my mates went and did. And some of them went on to play State of Origin and the same side. But my mother said to me, there's no way in the world you're going to be a footballer. And she went and enrolled me at university, exactly the same thing. And she, <laughs> she took me to the University of New South Wales <laughs> and uh, enrolled me in the course herself with me standing there like a little kid. I was only 17 at the time. And, uh, and I was a wild bastard when I was a kid. And... But I always did what my mum said, and uh, as you, as you said, my ma, and, yeah, uh, and yeah. she got me there, and uh, she did exactly the same thing. And thank God, yeah, for me. Yeah. And in your case, you enrolled in engineering, mm -hmm. and what I find fascinating is that there was no MMA coaches, mixed martial art coaches, coaches or jujitsu coaches, etc., in Ireland or Europe, really, for that matter, generally very small. Yeah, yeah, and uh, somehow. You um, cobble together a way of learning mixed martial arts. And I th feel as though it had something to do with your course. I mean, I just feel as though some of the learnings you got out of your university, your engineering, your ability to do mapping, you know, and uh, think clearly and learn stuff from what you did at university somehow helped you fill that void that existed in terms of proper coaching yeah yeah that's you know I, I sometimes wish that i'd done sports science or even something like accounting instead of engineering because of what had a very direct correlation to what i'm doing now and it would have been more helpful however i will say that uh you know when you when you graduate from engineering you what they say is you we've taught you how to learn now because you can go into any number of different um businesses uh, from engineering so i applied that sort of structured thinking, like you said, that ability to map things out to trying to learn MMA, because at the time I did, I was very lucky. I got a good friend early on that was from a high level judo background. And, you know, a lot of the techniques from judo translate to MMA, whether it's the throws, the ground positioning, but there was still quite a chasm to fill. Um, I'm just reminded very quickly there, because you were telling me about, you lying to your mother about doing the odd uh, boxing fight here and there. And that's what I, I did the same with when, when I was fighting in MMA. And, uh, you know, because I'd done a little bit of karate growing up and, you know, I'd go to England and come back with my head. Like, what, what were we doing? I was doing the karate tournament in, in, in the UK, you know. But it's used to say the same. And then my dad got wind one time. I always remember it, that I was doing cage fighting, as it was called. And I guess he didn't really want to let me know that he was worried about it. But I always remember he just was kind of like rustled his newspaper and just looked up and said, well, It'll be a shame if you break your back. And then he went back to, <laughs> went back to reading. And I guess that was his way of saying, be careful. Maybe you shouldn't do it. I, that's what I got from it. <laughs> um, but yeah, with the engineering, um, I, I do think it gave me a slight advantage back in a time when everybody in Europe was trying to figure out this new sport. You know, we didn't have the, 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 the wrestling culture of America or the jiu-jitsu culture of Brazil. 
even you know the eastern european countries and russia they have a similar uh culture of 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 um wrestling and grappling in ireland we had boxing for sure and i could i was there was no end of great boxing coaches and uh if, and field sports you know we didn't football soccer or whatever um so it was a slower process and now i'm somewhat envious i can get somebody in two years to where it took me 10 years you know we're, we're, we're we have the system quite um slick now and efficient. took you 10 years to get the your uh belt blue belt yeah somewhere. so I, I i was i think from beginning to end it was maybe 12 or 13 years to get a black belt, black belt. um whereas now we're get you know like say gunnar nelson the one the guy to come up underneath me he was less than four years getting a black belt that's exceptional um so there's a more efficient use of our time now you know we're in the gym we know what to do in a 60 minute or a 90 minute period to get the most out of it and somewhat the the engineering background gave me that ability to watch fights because that was my big thing i did i didn't have a, a gym to go to i would just watch tons and tons of fights whatever fights i could get my hand on and from each fight try to get a few lesson plans out of it let's see what's happening 80 percent of the time and 80 percent of fights that was a big approach of mine yes there's the odd spinning heel kick to the head that's in the 20 percent region so i'm going to give that 20 percent of my time but there's a lot of jabs there's a lot of crosses there's a lot of double leg takedowns there's a lot of back takes there's a lot of chokes that's what's happening most of the time that's where i'm going to do that's where i'm going to live most of the time and that seemed to get good results and I'm still going with the same approach. I'm trying to learn always, always new, always, always pushing myself, always wanting to learn new approaches to the gym, approaches to training, uh, mindset stuff, et cetera. But the actual core techniques of MMA, um, anybody can watch the fights and you can see what's, what's more common than uncommon. One of the Roosters players yesterday said to you, he's read your book. Um, and I presume the book he was talking about is, I think is win or learn or win and learn, win or learn. Win or learn. And what's interesting about that, um, that to me, anyway, I mean, from a nerdy point of view, it's, a, it's very much a, an academic's th thought, <laughs> uh, win or learn, in terms of the, the heading of the book. And, uh, but the thought process behind it um, influences young men. And do you sort of say to your customers, they're your customers, clients, globally, um, is it about saying to them it's not about winning, it's about learning? How does that all work? Yeah, um, you know, on any giving event, 50% lose, or even 50-50 chance winning mm -hmm. or losing. Um, but ultimately, what, what are we trying to do? I've got a martial arts gym with uh, hundreds of people in it. I've taught maybe tens of thousands of people over, over two decades. A very small percentage are going to go on and fight professional. So what, 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 we, what are we ultimately trying to do? And for me, it's to pass on this philosophy. We do it, in the, we do it on the mats. We do it in the gym. But I want them to be able to apply that to everything. And very simply, it would be that failure is not fatal and success is not final. And we're going to have knockbacks. We're going to have losses. We're going to have failures. The, the, the goal is, is to try to learn from them and fail our way up to success, lose our way up to success. And what I want to, because I'm, it's a common question for me is like, and while I'll use Connor because he's such a big name, when he has a loss on this big stage, how the hell do you get over it? You know, you've, he said so much in the lead up and then. There's just, a, you know, what maybe some people would interpret it as an embarrassing moment. You lose. How do you get up the next day? And what I'm saying is, is that that doesn't, that's not all handled on that night. That's handled with 15 years of training. That's handled with a hardening process of being subjected to that feeling of losing and failing on a very small, manageable level in the gym as a 17-year-old kid losing a drill. You know, it is losing. And, be and beginning to associate that lose, common losing, losing very often in the gym with ultimately learning how to deal with that situation. Whether it's, let's say something simple, slipping a jab. Okay, at the first few times you do that, you get caught a few times, you lost. But, you know, it, fast forward three months, whoop, every time that jab comes, you slip it. So you then start to associate, okay, oh, I want to learn a new skill. I've got to lose a lot before I get good at it. So someone once said, embarrassment is the price you pay for excellence. So I got to get embarrassed in the gym. And that's why I think a, a coach's if only role is that we need to make the gym an environment that's safe to lose. We don't want it to be, especially a bunch of young men, you don't want them going in there nervous about trying something new in case it doesn't work and 20 people pointing and laughing at them. We want it to be an environment where that 
they're running towards failure. They're running towards losses. They're running towards slipping and falling because they ultimately know that there is no other way of becoming excellent at any individual skill. You fast forward 15 years, you're fighting in front of 20,000 people, millions on the TV. You have a slip and a fall like that. Yeah, come on. No one's not going to lie. We're all competitive. It stings. But we remember our old days. We remember that the sun will rise the next day. It's not fatal. We will take some lessons from that, go back to the gym, and win, lose, or draw. Even if you won, it was going to be the same process, right? You're going to be back in the gym anyway. And that's been my philosophy for my running my small business, my small gym in Dublin. I've, had, I've moved 10 times in 20 years, so I've, almost every two years I'm, I move facilities. Sometimes I've been kicked out of facilities. Sometimes I've lost facilities. And, but I, I know I'm not going to stop. What's the alternative? That's going back to 18 year old me. What's the alternative? Stay in my room? I don't know. That's not going to happen. I'm going to take another shot as long as I have a breath in my lungs. And we keep, I mean, everyone in the, around the world, I mean, all the various social mediums are telling us about resilience. I mean, resilience is this word that we just keep saying all the time. And, but to be frank with you, I think a lot of people, especially between that 20 to 30 period, age, years of age, that cohort of people, they don't really understand, other than what they hear and read, what resilience is. I think what you're sort of saying to me, tell me if I'm right or wrong, is that your resilience at least is as, is as a result of failing, losing, recognising that. What can I learn from that and how can I put myself in a position that I won't fail or lose or reduce the probability of failing or losing when I'm next confronted with that situation? Yeah. So for me, professional sports, like what's the point of it? You know, I had a great opportunity to, to chat with the Roosters and maybe their arch enemies, the, the Sea Eagles. Um, and, you know, I've trained some professional fighters, but that stage of your life is very small compared to if we're lucky and we get 80 years, whatever it is these days. Um, if you could do professional sports for 10 years of that, is, that's a good career. I think a professional athlete's main, main role, what they do for society is that they're almost superheroes, you know, and they inspire us. And what do we love? Don't we love the story when a team has been beaten up, a couple of losses, they take from that, they learn, they train harder, they come back and they win the championship. And that small lesson is, I think, what those mere mortals that watch these guys is what we try and do in day-to-day -day lives. And that could be, could be business, it could be relationships, it could be... Um, you know, my own, my own small story. So I think about what these sports and what sports are so good at teaching young people is, is to make that association with uh, losing and failing with ultimately success. Because like you said, it's a, it's a very popular topic, building resilience. And I like that idea, but how? Give me, and that's maybe the engineer coming in. I want, I want evidence. I want to know why you think this will work. What's the plan? What's the day plan, week plan, month plan, year plan? And I've yet to find an, a, an approach better than sport for getting that through to people that to get good at something, you got to pay the price and the price is going to be embarrassment. You want to take up something, you know, those boys yesterday, the, the Roosters, what an amazing set of athletes. But if they, you know, maybe, maybe they're the odd musician, but if they're not, and I give one of them a guitar and say, okay, start playing the guitar, it's going to be in a, an embarrassing stage where he can't feel where his fingers are, but he knows how to learn. And he knows he has to go through that process. He knows it's going to be awkward. And a couple of months in of daily training, suddenly a sound comes out that's like, oh, that sounds like a song. And, and that's how we get good at learning a new skill, whether it's guitar, whether you want to start, one of those guys wants to start a cafe. Guess what? He's going to go through the first couple of months of every mistake that can be made. It's going to be knockbacks, failures. But he knows because he's come through the sporting world at the highest levels that that's in, unavoidable. That's inevitable. You got to go through that novice stage. You got to go through that embarrassing stage and keep your head at it. You blink, 10 years have gone past, and you're now seen as an expert there. You're using martial arts to not only teach them about martial arts, but also to take them to one level higher. Like you're leveraging into another uh, situation where they will hopefully take away their learnings from what they did in the program, the you know, half year program, whatever it is, to get to the point where they do actually have their very first fight in their life that they can take that into other things in their life. You know, is that one of your It's the only purposes? message. That it is it's the, the message, only yeah. message. Really? And I tricked them into doing it through the, <laughs> yeah. through the platform of fighting and being inspired by the stars, like, you know, if they're 
fans of Connor or Izzy or Volkanovski and all these incredible athletes. But for me, that's the whole point of it. And I do think combat sports is a little bit different than any other sport. Mm. Now, I love all sports. I, I, I love to see kids doing it. I don't care what it is. If it happens to be combat sports, great. But I do think there's something a little bit different about combat sports. And I, I love one of the things that by the end of a program, I think it teaches women that they can be more powerful than they are. At the start, maybe they don't think that they could physically defend themselves. And by the end, that confidence is there. And for men, sometimes, depending on the type of personality that walks in, it might teach them that they don't realize how vulnerable they can be in the hands of somebody that's trained. You know, some, some have come in with, because I think for men, there's, there's almost an, there's almost an, an assumption that you can fight, that you should be able to defend yourself. And it's like, well, if you haven't trained it, you won't be able to. And when you move around your first time with a, a high level fighter, it can be uh, scary, you know, seeing what, just how vulnerable you could be. But again, they go through the program. Um, but yeah, ultimately, that's what I want them to get from it. At the end of 20 weeks, it's great. You know, we have 40 people. There's going to be uh, 20 fights. 20 hands go up, 20 hands go down. 50% win rate on the night. That's just how it is. But I want everybody the next day to say, wow, I've learned some new skills, a bit more confident, a bit more self-belief. And I can now apply that process of understanding it's going to be tough. I can't promise you it'll be easy, but I can promise you it'll be worth it. That I'm going to go through that learning phase, that novice phase, that losing phase. And I can apply that approach to anything else I'm doing in life. Now, I reckon it's brilliant. Um, I mean, I've, I, I sort of know the feeling, uh, uh, you know, I've been through these processes in the ring myself. What is your experience of watching these individuals on the night they're about to jump into the octagon? How do they deal with the adrenaline rush and for their very, I mean, because you might have learned all the shit in your world <laughs> and you're, you're really confident you did all the training, yeah. you did the drills 5,000 times over. The next thing you know, your heart's pumping about a million miles an hour and you've got to, how many rounds they do? Um, so. Depending on the number of fights, in general, it's three by three minutes. Three threes, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't sound much, but it's a fucking lot. <laughs> you have a minute rest between rounds? Is it a minute break? Minute rest, yeah. 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 So it's sort of similar to boxing, but um, they probably think, it's, oh, I'll eat that because I can skip and I can train for an hour and a half, and all of a sudden they've got to do three threes. And they, but, but prior to the walking, as they're walking through and they, and they get into the, and they're getting announced, I guess, is, and there's all these people watching, all, your, all their team members watching, or and their families probably. Their heart's pumping like crazy. Um, <laughs> what's that experience like for them? What do they say to you? Um, oh, and do they gas sometimes? Sometimes. Yeah. What, <laughs> Does anybody every not time? gas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. But like, yeah. can it say, take me through that. What, what do they say to you about that event? And because, you know, we experience that in business. So sometimes we've got to go see yep. the bank, you know, and we're, we think we're okay, we're all prepared, but our heart, to, to, I mean, to being out of control ourselves or at least having experienced that yes. process. Yes. If, well, first of all, the quick answer is that at the end of every fight, people go, if I do that again, I'm going to get fitter. You know, yeah. There's the number one thing, right? I, I need to work on my conditioning. Every, everybody says that. Now, again, the whole point of this program is that I have a kind of a mantra. I tell them that we're here to make you comfortable in uncomfortable situations. So. There's whole book sections in, in, in bookshops, how to avoid stress. And I think that's the mistake. Because if you think you can avoid, avoid uncomfortable situations, and that's how you want to live your life, and then when one comes along, it can be very devastating because you weren't in any way ready for it. But if I tell you that every session, you're going to be in an uncomfortable situation from a very small, manageable amount, all the way up to in 100 days time, 100 lessons time, the most uncomfortable situation for most humans, the idea of sticking on a pair of Lycra shorts and stepping in a cage, if you go to see the bank manager after that, it's probably a step down. Hmm. Um, so the only way I know to get ready for something as stressful as that is that you must subject yourself to it, to some level of discomfort every day. Can you take me through the incremental process? Yes. So what, and the, to me, by the way, is once again, very engineered. That's why I see it. Um, yeah. And the thinking is engineered. Take me through the process of what you're trying to do here by making someone feeling uncomfortable yeah. incrementally. Yeah, let me give you a very easy uh, example. So if I've got 20 people on the mats and I say, okay, pair up, let's go back to the jab. Okay, your partner going to throw a jab, you slip and counter. Okay, off you go. 
Now, as long as they're doing that in that environment, that's very, very comfortable. No, even for some people that might be uncomfortable at the beginning, you've never done anything like that. And I'm standing in front of you and you throw a jab towards my face. We've had people that found that very uncomfortable. Let's say that level of comfort is okay. The next level of comfort is that while uh, you and your partner are doing it, I stand beside you. I go, okay, Mark, let's go. Let me see you. Oh, coach is watching me. That's a little bit more uncomfortable. Okay, now you're used to that. I stop the class. Okay, everybody stop. Mark's actually doing this really well here. All right, Mark, in the middle with your buddy here. And uh, don't screw up now. We're all watching. Okay, okay. Now there's 20 people watching you do it. Now the next level of it is, is that we're doing a drill where it's not so much. So I would call that introduction stage where the introduction is I throw a jab, you slip, bang. Now the next stage is isolation stage where we're doing the same technique, but there's an element of timing in it. And that is, I might faint a few times. Whoa, whoa. I might faint, boom, and then I throw it. And I'm doing it with a little bit more intent to try and tap you on the forehead. That's uncomfortable because now there's a sense of timing involved. Your coordination goes a little bit, your breathing goes. Now you're doing it in a full spar where I can kick, punch, take you down. And every now and again, that jab might come out and you, you have to try and pull off that technique. The toughest one I'll do in the gym will be I'll pull you and your training partner. You know, I have a full size competition size uh, cage in, my, in my, my gym. And I pull you two guys up and I say, all right, guys, in the cage for a one minute round. Let's see how many jabs you can land. And you've got to do that with 40 people watching you. So when someone does that for the first time, I call it a simulated fight. When someone does that for the first time, which might not happen for 10 weeks of their training, and I talk to them afterwards, they cannot believe that they were able to get through that one minute. They walked in day one, and the idea of seeing a fist coming towards them had them uh, falling apart. Maybe not falling apart, but being very worked up. They tell me, like, I knew that was coming today, and I couldn't sleep last night. And now they've just done a minute sparring in front of 40 people. And I'll purposely tell half, you cheer for Dave. The other half, you cheer for Mike and give them stick. I don't want to hear any technical cheering. I want to hear, kill them. Get up, you know? And uh, you just see that these people grow in front of you. That took me 10 weeks. In another 10 weeks, I can get three by three out of them in front of a thousand people in a free fight, you know, where it's not necessarily sparring pace, it's full pace. And it's just amazing to see that journey happen over a hundred day period. And that's why I love the program. Because it's, it's a genuine length of time to get to a real skill level in probably the most complex sport in the world. If it was twice a week for six weeks and you go in and have a fight, like, you know, there is some white collar boxing and stuff like that. That's fine, you know, give it a go. But it's not going to really give you a, a genuine feel of the skills involved. I don't believe it can give you the benefits of five months of 5 a.m. training and the genuine improvement from a very physical point of view, and the ability to deal with stress, the ability to deal with heart pumping out of her chest, whether we're getting ready for a physical confrontation or confrontation with the bank manager or with a, a, a bad relationship, whatever it might be, you know, because you've done that in the gym, you know that you're able to do that. You know that you did things you think you thought were impossible. And now I guess so many messages, what's, it's what kept me coming back to it. People a week after, a month after, a year after saying, man, I had a road rage, inc road rage incident and not that it turned physical, but I was able to keep myself calm during it. I went for remortgage and I was able to keep myself calm with it. And if, if, if that's not what mixed martial arts is for, I don't know what it is for. At the end of the day, whatever we're doing, whether it's, as you say, a road rage in incident or it's uh, going to refinance your mortgage or buying a new business and setting up or starting up a new business or we're all on our own at the end of the day. I mean, we can have a great team around us, but you're on your own. When you jump in the ring, what you train people, you're on your own. <laughs> you just <laughs> by yourself. It's just you and the other, the dude, you know, the yep. other person across from you. So I, 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 and I think that's what real resilience is. It's an incremental build up to the event and then experiencing the event and win or lose, it doesn't matter. And learning from the outcomes. Even if you win, you still learn yeah. as well as learning if you lose. So it's not about winning or losing. It's about learning, learning about yourself. Not about if it's you and me. It's not about me learning about John Kavanagh. I might find out, you know, he's a right-hander and blah, blah, blah. I might find a few things about you, but it's about learning about myself and, and that I can take into my business. I think that's, I think it's really brilliant. I, I love it. I, I do. I mean, I can't go past this opportunity to ask you, and maybe you've just explained a whole lot of things to me, but. Connor's, Conor McGregor's, you know, probably 
your best known train fighter that you've I don't think probably. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um and uh and uh and I often I marvel at the dude and um and he's you know he hasn't done so well in the last a uh, few few outings. But he always seems to be cool and relaxed and chilled and happy and uh as I said, totally fucking resilient. Yeah. Uh you know, one of my prouder moments, and it was a loss, was his first loss to Nate. And that was his first loss in the UFC. You know, he'd had he'd had, had his losses before that outside the UFC. And it was just how he held himself in that press conference. Cause I remember when the the staff come in and we're all backstage, you know, and you're you're devastated. Uh it's it's literally like it's 11 p.m. or 11.30 p.m. And the, the lady shyly came in and said, so there's a press conference, but you don't have to show up. And he's like, of course I'm going to show up. I go to every one when I win. You better believe I'll be there with the one I lose. And he sat there and was chest out and his shoulders back. And he said, yeah, I've lost before. Plenty of times. He came from amateur boxing. And, you know, in amateur boxing, you're doing it every other week. And sometimes your hand goes up, sometimes it doesn't. Certainly in the gym, thousands of losses in the gym. How many Times you have to tap out before you get to a high level in grappling, tens of thousands, millions. And he had lost an MMA outside of the UFC. So for him, I think everybody was, was expecting him to fall apart, but, and it didn't happen overnight. Like I said, that was a 15 year journey with him being continuously subjected to losses in a smaller er, in a smaller world that was not so much that would break somebody, but that would stress them it has to be stressful it has to be uncomfortable or else there's no adaptation same as weight training for example so i i loved how he held himself after that and and the last couple of fights i mean in particular the last one the poirier fight i thought that fight was going great you know and, and i have to look at the training cap and the lead up to it i will always uh praise effort over reward and the effort put in was incredible uh sorry effort over result because the result is somewhat a little bit over hands mma and, and boxing are amazing sports that you know the smallest of error it's, it's over aldo did an amazing training camp i've no doubt very dedicated fighter 10 years undefeated featherweight champion and 12 seconds later he's unconscious when he fought connor is did his coach do a terrible job did aldo not commit himself to the training 100 i know they did i know they put everything in that was a year-long training camp for those guys because it got cancelled a few times so for a year the whole life was on hold for this goes out unconscious in seconds. You know, field sports, you make a mistake, you might give away a try, but you got 80 minutes to get it back. In airs, it's, uh, see you next time, son, you know, and that could be six months before you get another run out. If at all. If at all, right? So the training camp went great. The, I believe the plan was good for that fight. Uh, the standard portion of it was going air away. Take my biased, subjective opinion, just look at the numbers. Two to one in air favor and, and significant strikes. And when Connor's land outlanding you two to one with significant strikes, that's just a matter of time before you're unconscious. Now, jump down the guillotine, pull the guard. Not quite part of the game plan. Shit happens. Five round fight. Um, defended himself well off his back, stood back up. And then who knows exactly what happened with the shin, whether he cut his elbow, whether he cut his knee, whether a little bit of uh, stress on it in the lead up to the fight. Whatever happened, Vegas, we rolled the dice, foot broke, fight's over. But come on, for me, that's a result that's a little bit out of your control. But the effort that went in and the lead up, uh, the improvements that were made, all of those things were a, a great, uh, in, in, in a, I, I think a great a little show of what, what he's like. That the ability to come back from a loss, the ability to deal with the pressures, the ability to deal with a tough training camp and then go out, give it his best shot, didn't go his way. Hey, life carries on, you know. And he's sweet. Yeah. I mean, he's done brilliantly out of Proper 12, the yeah. whiskey, uh, Irish whiskey brand. I've never really heard anyone talk about this uh, Proper 12, um, but like I've read that he sold it for a ridiculous amount of money and I mean, he's got a great brand. He's got lots of people who are following him. I'm sure he's got a platform, but that doesn't mean you've got a good business. <laughs> you've got to turn the whiskey business into a good business. It's yeah. not an easy thing to do. And I, I've seen he's been doing a lot of, they, they do a lot of sponsoring now, sponsored a lot of fights, fight nights, et cetera. Um, do you think he took that, uh, those learnings, those experiences away from the ring into his uh, other ventures? I certainly hope so. And uh, now that you've made me think about that, maybe I'm due like a little cut on some of those things. <laughs> <laughs> where's, where's your clip? <laughs> but seriously, yeah, you know, he didn't go to college. He left, left school and was straight away into uh, starting to become a plumber, you know, tradie, as you guys call it. 
Um, so he was going down that road. So he didn't have any real long formal education in certainly in any sort of business, but maybe the lessons learned in the, in the gym and okay, I'm, I'm going into something new. Uh, he's, you know, he's a great character in certain things. And, and one of them, I think, is his ability. He is immune to embarrassment. Now, what do I mean by that? He could on day one of starting, you know, proper 12 got very big, very quick. Mm. And it wasn't like he's hustling a few bottles out of the back of his car and it, it gradually over. This went very big, very fast. And I know that he'd step into a boardroom with no real formal education, surrounded by executives and, and people that have done this for, for and have no problem putting his hand up and asking questions that some people might say, oh, you can't ask that question. That, I'm going to see, I'm going to look silly. No problem for him. Immune to embarrassment. He's just going to ask questions until he's comfortable with it. Till he gets an understanding of it. And then he has it. He does seem to have just a good sense, a good, um, almost natural instinct, I would say, for, for making good decisions. Helps when you have 20 odd million people following you, of course. Um, and he will only do something he's very passionate about that he really enjoys. And whether, he's, whether it's the whiskey, whether it's his, uh, his um, fitness app, whether it's property, like he'll only go into something um, that really gets him up. He loves fighting. Seems to like whiskey and uh, he, he loves fitness training. So all the things that he's really motivated by, that's what he puts himself in. And he's not afraid to be the student. He's not afraid to be the white belt. He's not afraid to be the beginner. He's not embarrassed by not knowing something which he hasn't learned yet, but he knows how to learn it. And he'll just put himself into the middle of it. He'll keep asking questions until he gets to where he feels, now I'm at a, you know, now I'm ready for my first fight. And, and that's how he, I'm sure he approaches everything he does. That's brilliant. You've gone through a number of years, I don't know, 20, 25 years of doing this business. You've, you know, you've produced great, wonderful fighters, you know, with global recognition. You've now built a business where you've taken this idea of building resilience through incremental training to um, bring the best out of people in terms of their first experience through ultra being in the Ultra Warrior program. And as a typical engineer, I don't know what the hell you guys do, but engineers always end up in this space. And you've got partners, of course, but you've now managed to put yourself in a position where you built a platform, which is the ALTA platform, A-L-T-A platform, which is a platform. Well, you ex explain it. What, what is the platform and what is what you guys want to do digitally with, let's call it the fight game? Yeah. So in essence, uh, I love mixed martial arts and I think it has a lot to teach people physically and mentally. But I was only ever going to be able to reach a certain number of people as in my gym in Dublin. There's 500 people or so that can drive to my gym. This was a way of, of trying to spread that word globally. Um, I'll, I'll steal an analogy from my co-founder, Nick Langton. He says that CrossFit, what they did really well, was they took existing fantastic strength and conditioning gyms all over the world that had great equipment, great coaches, and they put them underneath this brand that made it a bit of an easier transition from people who would be interested in getting in shape or just weren't quite sure how to get there. You know, it could be a bit daunting walking into that weights gym the first time, hearing the clang and the, the bar hitting the ground if you've never done that, whereas they gave a, a easier on-ramp, let's put it that way. Now, for me, I think mixed martial arts is a completely different level, and I'm completely biased to any other sport out there, but I also understand that it can be very intimidating for somebody who has not done combat sports. But what we're, we're, we're doing is, I believe, making that on-ramp much more palatable for a whole different demographic of people. You know, back in the day when I was starting my gyms, the likes of you get a bunch of Connors every week walking up, young, tough, fit young lads that want to learn how to, f who can fight and want to learn how to fight a little bit better. But I want to, that's one out of every hundred people. What about the other 99 people that are interested in martial arts and at some level? And this has given them that ability because, you know, they might go on to trainalta.com and get their first few lessons at home where it's comfortable and, you know, learn how the fighting stance and some of the positions on the ground. And then we can ultimately connect them with a local combat sports academy that the coaches are, de you know, are fantastic. The, the equipment is great, but maybe they haven't got the, ex the expertise in marketing or advertising and how to get somebody across that threshold. Because I can speak as somebody that's run a combat sports academy for 20 odd years. That was something I always struggled with. I would teach all day long. I love being on the mat. I love new people coming in. 
but it was just how did I, how could I get them to come in? And my experience now, I'm only kind of new to it, is I've seen how a company is formed. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have my partner is an, ex, an expert in, in finance and business, but I also see that he's very uh, open to areas he's not good at. And he brings in someone who's an expert in technology, someone who's an expert in marketing. And that to me is what I so, kind of do as a, uh, somebody once described me, he said, you're not just a coach, you're a performance director. Your job is to make sure you're surrounded by the best guys in different areas of mixed martial arts. You know, does, I don't let my ego get in the way and say, no, I'll teach the boxing classes. No, get a good boxing coach in, get a good wrestling coach in, get a good jiu-jitsu coach in. And then your job is to kind of oversee it. And that's what I see Nick does with his gym, of, you know, of, of experts. So I'm your, very bi- your business gym. My business gym, right? Yep. And it's, I can see it. It's a, the exact same, you know? He didn't know how to do the technology side. He didn't try to say, oh, I will teach it. Like, and I see that sometimes in MMA gyms. It's like, no, let's look around. Who's the best? Right, get him, put him in that position, and then kind of oversee it as a performance director. That's what we'd call him in the sporting world. Um, so look, that, that's what I believe this program is going to do. It's going to take all these tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of great individual combat sports academies and give them a global voice so it's that we can let the whole world know, you know, it's racing towards a billion fans of mixed martial arts, that this sport, this activity is for you. They may initially think they're coming in just to learn how to punch and kick. I know what the ultimate message will be at the end of it, this incredible self-improvement from a mental point of view. It's nice. People drop weight. You get the Instagram photo. But that's not the, the, the real message for me. There's plenty of those transformational programs out there. Combat sports is about transforming up here getting it the resilience from it that I don't think any other sport can give it quite that way and applying that to the rest of your life. And trainalta.com is going to do that for the martial arts world. So it's called trainalta, A-L-T-A, dot com? Yes. So effectively, it's a marketplace yes. where you're matching um, consumers of this product, not necessarily your product, but the product that other gyms might want to have. So a consumer can come to trainalta.com yeah. They can look around and say, uh, yeah, I live in uh, Potts Point, Sydney. There's uh, you know, a gym up there in King's Cross somewhere. And you then match everybody. Um, you help the, the gym dude find the customers. That's what you're doing. Yes. Um, you collect the money for it. Yes. Um, you, know, you do all the, the financial transactions, which helps the, the gym owner not have to worry about collecting money because they're I didn't traditionally want to do no good at it. Let's talk about me. I didn't want to do any of that side of it. I don't understand marketing. Yeah. None of those things. I love coaching. And I love seeing students come from day one, not knowing anything, to day 100, being able to have their first little amateur fight. And, you know, more importantly, what goes on inside their school. But just give me the people. Give me, give me 50 people, 60 people every six months, and I'll do that till the day I die with a big smile on my face. Please don't ask me to start taking out credit card details or start chasing people for late payments or, um, you know, like I said, all the other aspects that go into bringing in 50 uh, you know, good clients that can, can pay the fees and are, want to learn the skills. So we keep the coaches in their sweet spot. And the, the most gyms, most MMA gyms are owner, uh, owner operator. You know, the, 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 guy that, the guy that started it, maybe he was a fighter, didn't quite make retirement money, or he just loves coaching. A lot of them slip into that. And that's what they know. They have a lifetime of martial arts. They've got so, many, so much life lessons to give so much skills in mixed martial arts. And what a shame if that person goes through their entire coaching career with 15 people on the mats every day. We want to put 150 people on the mats there. We want the facilities to get better because guess what? When that small leaking gym that's freezing cold starts generating income, you can get better, get a new boxing ring in, get some new pads in, fix the hole in the roof. I had a hole in my roof for the first two years, so (laughs) get that hole fixed and um, make it a, a, a more welcoming training environment so that we can bring in the people, not just the Conor McGregor's and the, the Izzy's and the Volkanovskis. They're easy to coach, all right? You get a guy like that, you show him a few things, they're, get out of their way, they're good. The challenge is, is taking the people that, I will see, use myself, 15 years of age, scared stiff of everything, but bring them through that journey, give them resilience, give them bite-sized amounts of stress until he's a this character that can go into society and be productive, be strong, be independent, be self-confident and be ready to take on life. I think it's brilliant. It seems to me 
and I've got to declare my position. I mean, I have a, an investment in this with you and, and others, but, uh, but I'm not, to be honest with you, I never read any of the documents. I mean, I, I just did because of, because of you and Nick. Um, but I, I've actually got quite excited about the whole concept, much more as excited than I've ever been before. But what I, I just can't help myself going back to when you were, you know, the young, young lad and you were stuck in your house there for six months sort of feeling like shit as a result of the bad incident, bad experience you had. Looks like what you've done to me is that you've deconstructed um, the, the, the fight game, whether it's boxing or jiu-jitsu or judo, whatever it is, and you've, you've deconstructed it on a global basis, well, the ability to be global. You build a marketplace allowing uh, – and you've reconstructed this whole thing. So your dad would be proud of you, being in the building industry. Um, you've re reconstructed it just like you did how you worked out how to go and learn how to do MMA. Deconstruct, reconstruct. It's an engineering mindset. It's a mindset. It's a thought process. You know, it's, it's, very, um, it, it's very, very clever. And you've reconstructed this platform, which has built a marketplace for everybody to benefit. You get your whole concept of resilience and being able to take from the fight game and be able to take that resilience into your general life. You put that ingredient in. Um, uh, coaches. You know, Larry Papadopoulos said in King's Cross Gym, if he joined up, he can use your marketing power and your billing power, the ability to collect the money, which is shit he can't do, and he's hopeless at it. And then, uh, then you've, and you've given consumers somewhere to go where it's, they're not going to be intimidated so they can incrementally get involved in something that ordinarily they would never walk into Larry's gym because they think, oh, fuck, they don't know Larry. Larry's the nicest bloke in the world. But they just think, oh, it's an MMA gym. There's all these tough bastards there. I'm, I'm ship scared. So. They can creep their way in very slowly and confidently and get a good outcome. I think the whole outcome, it's a great story, the whole outcome of what you've done and your partners, and like, and, and this is all partnership, you know, Nick Langton, who's just standing over there to our right, no one can see him on camera, but uh, it's a good combination of great skills. And uh, for me, uh, I think the deconstruction process and the reconstruction process is just a brilliant lesson for us. And the outcome of resilience is like is just where we all want to be at the end of the day. That gives us peace of mind. So, John Kavanagh, thanks very much. Fresh in from Ireland. I know you're on your way back. You've only been here a week. I really appreciate your time. It's been wonderful. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. 